spent some time at a local retailer and was looking at the Christmas decorations, seeing if maybe there's some things that could be added into the sanctuary and the lobby, things like that. And I was looking around and started seeing some different things. And I'm like, there was one thing that I started to get and like said, Merry Christmas. And I'm like, hey, that's great. It, it actually has Christ on there. That's, that's wonderful. But then it said, Merry Christmas. Ho, ho, ho. Right. That's not exactly what I'm looking for. And then I look over to the side and I see something and it says, believe. I'm like, yes, we need to believe in the Christ of Christmas. And then I notice that underneath the word believe, there's a reindeer. And I'm like, okay. okay. And I just kind of looked and looked more and more and... And it's like the more I looked, the more it just seemed like Christmas is about Santa Claus, not, not Jesus. And I, I always thought Christmas was about, you know, like Christ, like, because that's in the Word, right? But it's, you know, it's okay. I mean, I, I don't have anything against Santa Claus, right? I mean... He's a nice guy. He's a jolly guy and everything. And I don't have a problem with, with families that want to say, hey, you know, kids, we're going to pretend or whatever, and Santa Claus is coming, and so you got to go to bed. Don't, don't let him see you. You know, if he sees you awake, you're not going to get your presents. Or, you know, I'm, I'm cool with that, whatever. Parents, you get to navigate that on your own. But here's the deal, at our house, we made a decision that we were going to tell our ch child, our children, whatever, before, we were going to tell them the truth, okay? Truth is a pretty good policy in, our, in my, my book, and so came to having children, like, we're going to tell her, her, them, the truth, and sure enough, Seal's about three years old, and we're in Walmart, or at least her and, and Becky were at Walmart, and she's going through the Christmas stuff, and she sees Santa Claus or something, and she says, Mom, is Santa Claus real? And parents, maybe you've been in that position before. It's like, what, what do we do now? Do we just say, yeah, he is? Or do we say, um, honey, we'll talk about that when you're 18? <laughs> what? What, what do you do? Well, well we, our policy is to give them the truth, to give her the truth. Now, there's times where we have to say age appropriate, you, you know, we, certain things like, okay, here's as much of the truth as you need to know right now, and we'll, we'll give you more as <laughs> you get older and become more uh, adept at being able to handle the more information and understand that and all, all of that that goes along with it. But she just said, you know, honey, um, no, he's not real. And she's like, yeah, I knew it. <laughs> Had to figure it out. Like, you know, there's no way. I mean, definitely evidence that she is her mother's daughter, okay? She, she's smart. I, it would have taken me a lot longer to, to figure this one out. And I'm like, there's no way... No way one person can be in all these different places at the same time or, or, or fit in a fireplace, you know? And, and like, if the fireplace is on, how does that work? You got to shut off the fire? And, and what if you don't have a fireplace? What happens then? And, like, it just didn't make sense. And logically, she began to doubt. And so she asked, who can you trust? Well, you can trust mom and dad. Well, they'll... Tell her the truth. The bad news, though, is she went to school a few late years later, and teachers talking about Santa Claus and say, "Hey, hey, Santa, how you doing? Great! You know, I got all these boys and girls, and they're just looking forward to seeing you." And the teachers going on and on, and my my daughter is my daughter after all, and like, hey, um. He's not real. <laughs> we, we did have a conversation to say, you know what? Other kids are, 
parents are going to pretend, and it's okay. We're going to let them pretend. But she's kind of like, enough's enough. Let's get, let's get on with the show already. He's not real. And so the teacher didn't really like, I guess, that there's a disruption to the class or whatever. And so teacher decides to have a conversation with mom. And I'm like, your daughter said Santa's not real. <laughs> like, newsflash teacher, he's not! <laughs> She, she handled it much more gracefully, I'm sure, than I would have, because my, my sarcasm and all that probably would have came out a little bit too, too thick. I don't know. Like, well, I'd appreciate it if blah, 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 blah. Like, okay. But here's the thing. We're going to tell our daughter the truth. And some people would say, you know what? Bah humbug, Pastor Lynn. What's wrong with you? I mean, get into the Christmas spirit. And here's the thing. Like I said before, I've got, I've got nothing against Santa Claus other than, other than just think, something to think about. He wears a red suit. You know anybody else who wears a red suit? Could it be Satan? And you, just think about this. You take the letters of Santa and the letters of Satan... Hmm. Hmm. Now, I'm like, really? you guys are like, man, I am not going back to that church. He, he just called Santa Satan. Now, here's, please hear me. It's old Saint Nick, he's, he's, a, he's, he's a fine guy. Not, nothing wrong with, with Saint Nick. But just like many of you, you start to get on like, what? You can't pick on Santa Claus. Like, we want to believe and like just kind of have a little fun or whatever. But, but then there's also that doubt and, and probably every single one in here go would say, if I asked you, do you believe in Santa Claus? You would say, no. Are you kidding me? Because at some point, there's a battle and you started to doubt. You started to doubt. And there are different things in life that cause us to go bah humbug. In fact, you guys know of Scrooge, right? From Charles Dickens' Christmas Carol. Bah humbug. It's just so fun to say it. I, I want you guys to be able to join in on the fun. Everybody on the count of three, give me your best bah humbug. One, two, three. Bah humbug. Now, there are different ways that you can say bah humbug. You can say bah humbug as like, I doubt it. Bah humbug. It's kind of like baloney. You know, I doubt it. You can say bah humbug as in a dismissive tone, like, that's not going to happen. You, you can say it in a, and some of you gave it your best, and, and you can say it like Scrooge often did, and you can say it with a tone of disgust. Like, not in my house, and not going for that. And here's what happens. As adults, oftentimes, teens and adults, we've gotten past Santa Claus. I'm like, okay, here's this. Here's what I've been taught or whatever, and, and here's logic. And we go, okay can't happen. But then if we're not careful, what happens is we go, here's what I've been taught about Jesus, but I don't know how to balance that. It seems like maybe, I don't know, do I, do I kind of do the same thing with Jesus that I did with Santa Claus? And like, well, I've outgrown that, or I, I doubt that, or, or whatever. And here's the series is all about connecting dots. So we can overcome the Bahambugs. Bahambugs are these doubts and obstacles that come our way that keep us from truly celebrating the Christ of Christmas. And so today I want to jump into Matthew chapter 2. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 2. And here's the big idea for our day. Jesus is the promised king. Jesus is the promised king. It's the big idea that we'll see in Matthew chapter 2. Now, Matthew is writing particularly to the Jews. Each gospel account has kind of a target audience that not so much just the writer had in mind, that God had in mind. And God wants 
the Jews, his chosen people, to know his son. And so Matthew writes an account of Jesus Christ so that the Jews would know who Jesus is and so you and I could know who Jesus is and to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus is the promised king. And so let's jump in to Matthew chapter 2, shall we? And we'll see right from the beginning that some doubt that Jesus is the promised king. Some will doubt that. That's why Matthew is writing. There's a lot of Jews that doubt that Jesus is the promised king. So Matthew's connecting dots. And Matthew's going to give us four prophecies from Old Testament written hundreds of years before that will connect the dots, and particularly for the Jews, but also for us, to eliminate doubt that Jesus is the promised king. But there's a couple things when it comes to doubt that I want us to understand. The first thing is this. We doubt because we're not God. You may not have come to terms with this, but you don't know everything. Some of you are like, <laughs> he's talking to you. <laughs> we don't know everything. And because we don't know everything, we're going to have doubt. And sometimes there's a lot of logic behind that doubt. Like if I said, the Lions are going to win the Super Bowl this year, you would say, I doubt it. If I said... By the end of 2018, Washington, D.C. will have a balanced budget. You would say, <laughs> but on the other hand, if I was to say, God loves you, I would hope you would say, I don't doubt that. But, but there's a reason we doubt. We doubt because we're not God. The, the second thing I want us to, to just understand, kind of come to terms with, is this. God is not threatened by our doubt. Whether, believe, whether we believe in him doesn't change who he is. Whether you believe in him, whether you believe in everything that God's word says about him, doesn't change. It, it doesn't, doesn't go, oh, <laughs> the belief meter is going. So now, like, ha, I reached a new level. No. God's God. God doesn't change whether you believe in him or not. You just might, though, change whether you believe in him or not. So some doubt that Jesus is the promised king. First one, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem, here we go, here's our first sign, pay attention, we'll come back to this in a little bit. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. Verse 3, when King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied. Catch this. For this is what the prophet has written. Years ago, God gave us this dot. God gave us this sign. God gave us this promise, this prophecy that a king would be born. And he would be born in Bethlehem. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. So here we go. The first sign, the first arrow pointing to the identity of the king. He would be born in Bethlehem. So we continue on. And we see, though, that some will dismiss the king as just a kid. 
I don't know if you caught this or not. The Magi are seeking and they're asking. They're looking for questions and they go to the religious leaders. They knew who Jesus was. They knew where he was to be born. They knew that the promised king was to be born in Bethlehem. But did they pay any attention to Jesus? Did they go looking for Jesus? No, they, they just seemed to dismiss Jesus as just a kid. As if to say, you know what? He's not even old enough to vote. Why would we mess with him? Why would we listen to him? Why would we seek him out? He's not worth our time. And so when we come to Christmas and we talk about the Christ of Christmas, there are those that doubt, and we come by it honestly. Doubt that Jesus is the promised king. Doubt that Jesus really is the reason for the season. But then there are others that just, not so much that they doubt Jesus, it's just that they dismiss him. Just going on about their own business as usual. Pay no attention. Jesus is just a voice among many. There's lots of kids, but there's only one king. And so we just dismiss him. And we continue on. Verse 7. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way. And the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. I'm not going to dive into it today. I'm going to just say, why, why don't you do a search on gold, frankincense, and myrrh? These wise guys had a pretty good idea of the identity of who Jesus was. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Eat your special gifts. Google it and find out how and why. Verse 12, And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to where? Egypt. Here we go. Second dot, second sign, second promise, second prophecy to help us understand the identity of the promised king. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night, and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled, everybody say fulfilled, yes. what the Lord had said through the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. And here we go. The second sign, the second dot, the second prophecy about the identity of the king that Matthew wants us to understand so that we can connect these dots. Not only would he be born in Bethlehem, but he would be, that he would spend time in Egypt. I mean, we're, re we're really narrowing down the pool of possible candidates of who this king could be. And keep in mind, these are prophecies hundreds of years before Christ came to earth. I gave the uh, scripture verses for where these prophecies can be found in the Old Testament as well. Some of you have notes in your Bible that will help you out with that. Some of you don't. And so I want to help you as much as I can. When, when Matthew says the prophet said, here's where he's referring to. Here's who he's talking about. 
As we go on, verse 16, when Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi. I don't know what happens to you when, when you've been outwitted and some of you say, oh, it never happens. <laughs> Ever been outsmarted? Some of you are going, yeah, by my seven-year-old. <laughs> I tell you, you've got to watch out for those sometimes, right? Well, just, just like often with us, when we get outwitted, we get a little perturbed. I think especially maybe more so us males we don't like to be shown up. And especially people that are like Herod. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious. And he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem, and I want us to see this, its vicinity. So we're talking about a 10 to 15 mile radius coming out from Bethlehem. Okay? We're going to catch all of the possible ones, okay? I don't know, Herod didn't know exactly the identity of, of the promised king, He knew where he was to be born. He knew some things about him. He knew that he was a a threat to the throne. That's how Herod saw him. And so he has all of the children, all of the boys that were two years old and under, in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi, had them killed. You see, he's not going to just kill a kid, though. He's going to kill the king. And some are disgusted with competition to the throne. That was Herod. He was disgusted with competition to the throne. You say, some some doubt Jesus and doubt that he's the promised king, and they would say, bah humbug. Yeah, I don't believe it. There's others that will dismiss Jesus as the promised king. It's kind of a mild bah humbug, but there's a bah humbug nonetheless. And then there are those that, at least in the heart of hearts, you talk about Jesus being king, and you say, bah humbug, not going to happen in my life. He's not the king. I'm the king. It's my throne. It's my party, and I'll do what I want to. I'm going to go to Burger King and have it my way. You know, it's all about us. And Herod wanted to eliminate what he saw as competition to the throne. And oftentimes, I think we want to do the same. And our culture wants to do the same. Can't help but wonder, what, what's the big deal with courthouses not wanting mangers set up on their yards. Is our nation that afraid of a kid? Of a baby? No. You see, people don't like competition to the throne. Jesus Jesus seems to be the only one that I can really think of that elicits such such a, a response from people. Because if you really believe and you take the time to connect the dots and, and really overcome the Bahambugs, you're faced with this identity crisis, this, this crisis of who is king. Is it Jesus or is it you? And Herod thinks that somehow he can dethrone the king and stay on the throne of his life and keep Jesus from ruling and reigning. Somehow Herod, even though he believed, apparently, right? apparently believed that, yes, Jesus was the promised king, that there's this, this one that's been born that was prophesied hundreds of years before. And somehow Herod's going to be able to do something about it. Think that we can stop God. But we, 
are reminded he's the king, the promised king. Verse 17. Herod was trying to stop Jesus, the promised king. And yet, in trying to stop Jesus, the promised king, Herod ends up happening, happening to help fulfill and provide another dot that we can connect for the identity of the promised king. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, that surrounding vicinity of Bethlehem. Weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. And so here's our third sign, our third dot that we can connect to know the identity of the promised king in Ramah. We continue on. Verse 19, after Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, get up, take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel. For those who were trying to take the child's life are dead. So he got up, took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning in Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Having been warned in a dream, he withdrew to the, dis to the district of Galilee. Verse 23, and he went and lived in a town called Nazareth. Hmm. So was fulfilled what was said through the, before, I don't know if you caught this or not, but before it was said, so was fulfilled the prophet or the prophecy, etc. And it was singular. Here we have Plural. Now, there are some different opinions on what this is all about. The most logical conclusion in my mind that you can come to, that I could come to anyway, is that we go back and we look at Nazareth and understand that Nazareth is, is uh, talking about the root or the stem. And if you go back and you look at, and I've provided a number of different um, passages there in your teaching notes that all were prophecies about the one called the root or the branch. And it's the word that we get for Nazareth. And it wasn't just one, there were multiple ones. Jeremiah, Zechariah, number of different ones that he would be called a Nazarene. And so there we have Bethlehem, Egypt, Ramah, and Nazareth. Four different ones that Matthew has provided us in one chapter alone to point to, to say, you know what, let's eliminate the doubts, let's overcome the obstacles to understand that Jesus is the promised king. That Jesus is the promised king. Now, Here's the thing, though. You remember the Magi? You see, they're a little different than the rest of our story. We talk about the Jews. We talk about a lot of people and, and their doubts. And the Magi, they overcame doubt. They overcame that by humbug. They went and they searched. So not only did they overcome doubt, but they didn't dismiss Jesus. They went after Jesus. And when they were getting close to where Jesus was, the Bible says they were overjoyed. But not only were they overjoyed, not only did they, did they pursue Jesus, they bowed down and they worshipped Jesus. And they presented him with gifts, understanding that he was the promised king. The Magi give us a great example of how to overcome the Bahambugs. To follow the star and to worship the promised king. And here's a couple things I want to just kind of throw out. Some of you, even after all that we've gone through, even after all that Matthew has given us, some of you are probably still in your heart of hearts going Bahambug. 
I doubt that Jesus is the promised king. There's still doubt about the Christ of Christmas. And you know what? As much as I would say, want to be able to say, stop doubting, just believe, I'm okay with you doubting. As long as we're, we come to this agreement that honest doubt leads us to pursue reason, pursue logic, and to understand that God didn't just stop here with these four dots. He provided a lot more to help us understand exactly who this Christ of Christmas is. And so for those of you that maybe are remaining in your doubt, I just ask of you, would you consider continuing to pursue and see what other dots we can connect to help us understand the identity of this one called Jesus? That's what we'll do in the coming weeks. It's also what Lee Strobel wants to do in the book that we've offered, The Case for Christ. And so even if you're somebody that comes regularly, because I understand sometimes people come to church because it's something to do. It's not necessarily because they believe. And so maybe that's you. Pick up one of those books. Read it. Dig into it. Maybe get a hold of the bigger book, The Case for Christ. Dig into that. There's some other books that if you're interested in reading and you really want to pursue truth, <laughs> because that's what the Magi were doing. They were pursuing truth. And if that's you, I'd love to be able to give you as many resources or at least point you in the resources, uh, point you in the direction of those resources as much as I can. But I have this kind of sneaky feeling that there's a lot of you that would say, I, I'm not a doubter. I'm a believer. And I'd say, that's awesome. But are there areas of your life where you've actually, it's not that you've been doubting Jesus as the promised king, you've been dismissing him as the promised king? Or, or maybe even that there are areas in your life that, that you're just disturbed because Jesus says one thing, his word says one thing, his word says this is the way to live, and you want to live a different way, and so there's competition for the throne. And so as much as you want to say and point to others and say, Jesus is the reason for the season, but inside you're saying, bah humbug. He's not going to be the king of my life. Here's what we like to do, though. We like to say, God, you can be the king of my life in this area. Because I've come to a point where I know I need you in my life. <laughs> but I'm going to keep this part to myself. I'm going to be king of this domain. There's something about God. God doesn't want just part of our heart. God doesn't want just part of our life. God wants all of our life. I heard somebody once say, God's either Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. And so maybe this Christmas season, to really be able to celebrate the Christ of Christmas, you, you need to come to a point where in your heart of hearts you bow before Jesus, the promised King, and say, I surrender the throne to you. It, it's yours. I don't know what it is for you today, but I do want you to know that God has connected the dots for us and that there's no doubt in my mind, and I sure don't want to dismiss him, and I sure don't want to fight over the throne of my heart, that Jesus is the promised king. And we see that when we understand that Jesus is the promised king, we can overcome the Bahamugs that we have peace in our lives. Jesus said himself, my peace I give to you, he said, in this world you will have trouble. But take heart, 
I have overcome the world because he's king. He's king. And we can have peace this Christmas season. And a lot of times, the reason we have a bah humbug is there's not peace. We can have peace because we know that he's got it. He's the king. And he's, on, he's in charge. He's still on the throne. The magi knew. They understood. He controls the stars. And as, as somebody wants to, if he can hold the stars in place, if he can call them by name, like, I can trust him. You know, like, I mean, he's got it. This Christmas season, you can have peace because Jesus is the promised king. And you can have peace because you're not at war trying to fight for something that rightfully belongs to him. So I'm going to invite our praise team to come back up, sing a couple more songs about the Christ of Christmas, the peace that we can have because that Jesus is the promised king. I'm going to invite our ushers to make their way forward as well. And I'll just say it. Preachers get a hard time or whatever, get a knock for talking about money a lot. It's not a subject I talk about a whole lot, but it, we'll just put it out there. This, this is for some of you, and you just said, yep, Christ is going to be king. Jesus is going to be king in my life. And here's the one domain that most oftentimes is the one that we want to hold on to, money. It's why Jesus talked about it, I believe, the most. Because where our treasure is, there our heart will be also. Now, please don't give just because that's not a guilt trip. I don't pack people's bags for them. But I do want you to understand this is like where the rubber meets the road. When you talk about Jesus being king of my life, it's, it's like, am I going to give like God tells me to give? Okay, I don't, know what, I don't know what you give. I don't know who gives, and I don't know what you give. I like it that way. And then I can get up here and just preach and know that I, it may be you, it may be your neighbor, it may be for nobody. But I'm guessing somebody's going, okay, God, I hear you. Let Jesus be king of everything. Let's pray. Father, you are worthy of our praise. Not just because you rule and you reign and, and you are the authority. But we can have peace because we know that you're a good God. You're a good king. You want what's best for your people. And so, Father, in humility and with thanksgiving, we give before you, Lord, our, our tithes, our offerings, and our praise. May you be honored. May your name be exalted. May Jesus, the promised King, be real and alive in our hearts and lives. And may Jesus, the promised King, be known in this community. We pray and ask this in and for your name. Amen.